Hi, this is Mr. Collier, and this is the first of two presentations about Protus. And so this first presentation, what we're going to talk about is the general biology that we find amongst all Protus, and then we're going to talk a little more specifically about one of the groups that includes Protus, and that is called the supergroup Archaeoplastida. So let's go ahead and get started. Protus all are categorized, classified as eukaryotes. And so what that means is that these organisms share a common ancestor along with plants, animals, and fungi. And so while they have characteristics similar to that, none of them are classified in those groups, but rather amongst different groups. And so while they share that in common, they also have in common that they have nuclei. And so organisms in the domain eukarya have cells with nuclei. They also have organelles or membranous organelles. And so these organelles are thing, um, include specifically the mitochondria and then what we call plastids, which includes chloroplasts and then a similar organelle called a chromoplast. So the origin of these plastids and mitochondria actually can be traced back to and is explained by this endosymbiotic theory. And so this diagram here shows how the evolution of groups of prokaryotes actually formed what we now know as eukaryotes. And so the first to develop was the cell nucleus here. And so later the symbiotic relationship between aerobic bacteria formed what we are now known as mitochondria. Later on, the addition of photosynthetic bacteria came to be what we now know as the chloroplast. And so this, this is um, supported with evidence from both DNA evidence. And then similarly, we can see that it, when these organelles reproduce, they do so in a manner similar to how bacteria produce, what we call binary fission, where they essentially divide in half. And so while the cell nucleus undergoes a mitotic division, these organelles reproduce simply through uh, asexual reproduction. So while, the <clears throat> while these are the simplest organisms, they are also the most diverse. And so some of the characteristics that we see amongst the protists include that they vary in size. And so many are unicellular. However, we have many that are also, or we have a few that are also multicellular or multicellular instead. So these pictured here, like our Volvox and our Amoeba, these are just simple single-celled organisms. Uh, the Volvox exists in what we call a colony. <clears throat> However, it is, a, it is comprised of single cells. Our kelp, which is also classified as an algae or a protist, can grow up to 200 meters in length. And so you can see that they vary greatly in their size. Protists are classified or can be grouped according to how they obtain in energy. And so some of these organisms are photoautotrophic. And so that means that they are able to collect the sun's energy. So our Volvox here is like a, is plant-like in the sense that it converts sunlight into, into energy. Other organisms are heterotrophic. And so that would be something similar to an animal. So this picture here of an amoeba is an organism that will consume others, other microorganisms. And so very similar to the way that a, an animal would capture and consume another animal. Amongst the protists, we also have some that we call mixotrophic. And mixotrophic means that they obtain energy from, from both sources. And so the, the euglena is an example of this that relies on both photo uh, uh, photosynthesis as well as heterotrophism. Now protists reproduce primarily asexually and so as we said with <clears throat> in the previous slide that that is where the organism is very simply going to divide in half and so most most protists reproduce that way with the exception of a few that may, under envi certain environmental condition, environmental stress, may actually reproduce, a, reproduce sexually. And so one way that sexual reproduction happens is through the formation of what are called cysts. 
and this is essentially a, a dormant form of the organism and so it will go into this dormant period until it changes to a a more ideal environmental conditions and this is particularly common amongst those parasitic protists like those things that are responsible for human diseases like malaria and African sleeping sickness and so while these parasitic protists certainly garnish a lot of attention because of their effect on on humans they're the protists are actually quite significant and very important ecologically as they serve the basis of many food chains. In fact, what you and I refer to as plankton consists primarily of these photosynthetic and sometimes heterotrophic microorganisms. As you can see in this diagram here, which comes from the Tree of Life project, there's a great deal of diversity that we find amongst the protists. And so with the exception of a few of the organisms here, or groups of organisms like our green plants, our fungi, and then our animals, with the exception of these three groups, everything shown here is what would be classified as a protist. And so one of the ways that scientists group these organisms is through what we call supergroups. And a supergroup is just a level that is higher than a kingdom, yet under a domain. And so we're going to talk about six of these primary, excuse me, six of these supergroups. The six supergroups that we're going to talk about here include the Arcadoplastida, which we'll talk about more in this one, the Epinthesicons, which includes animals and fungi, the Amoebozoa, the Rosaria, the Chromobiolatis, and then the Excavates. And so these are the six groups that we'll discuss uh, through the course of our discussion of Protus. So the supergroup Archaeoplastida includes land plants, but it also includes green algae. And so what you see here is Kalimit. Domanus, which is a single-celled algae that is actually motile, meaning that it moves. And so while you can't see it in the picture here, this organism has a flagella, and so it is able to move similar to how we would see an animal. The third group in the Archaeoplastida is what is called the red algae. And so let's talk about the green and red algae. Scientists group these organisms along with land plants, primarily because they have similar chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. They're also included because they have a cell wall that's made of cellulose, and then they also store energy in the form of starch. And so green algae can be divided into two groups called the chlorophytes and the charophytes. And so both of them include both single-celled and multi-celled organisms. An example of the chlorophyte here is what is called ulva, or more commonly referred to as sea lettuce. And then amongst the charophytes, we find a the spirogyra, and then we also see an organism, uh, also included in this group would be an organism called the stonewort. And so this one is, is what scientists believe to be one of the most closely related organisms to plants. And so of the two groups, charophytes is considered to be clo more closely related. Lastly, we have here the red algae. And so these are so named or categorized primarily because of what we call accessory pigments. And so unlike chlorophyll, um, these are not green, but rather are, are able to absorb lights of different wang wavelength. And so this red algae, which exists in warm seas, is able to absorb light at depths, um, in some cases up to 70 meters or 200 feet, and so it is able to absorb a different wavelength of light than is chlorophyll A. And so this red algae, there are over 5,000 species, and, and some of them are particularly economically important. Uh, nori, which is used in Japanese uh, sushi, um, is a red algae, and then agar, which is used in by a biomedical research like uh, gel electrophoresis. It's also even used in the production of vitamins and cosmetics, and, as well as in the uh, desserts like ice cream. So <clears throat> these, this group of organisms is, does have some particular importance. And so that summarizes, that summarizes the Archaeoplastida. So I hope you learned something.